I feel slightly nervous introducing the preacher when he's not standing behind me, but we know he's in the building. <clears throat> so welcome, welcome everyone, uh, whether you're online or here in the church today, it's great to see you. Uh, happy Mother's Day, everyone. Uh, if you're a mother, if you uh, act as a mother uh, to someone, we all appreciate what you do. For anyone who's new uh, to the church, if you, if you would like to know more about the congregation here, please do feel free to speak to me after the service. My name is uh, Don Versleith, and I'm one of the elders here. This week's uh, newsletter is, uh, is full of news. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to draw your attention to. One is the vacancy update. Uh, there is a meeting of the vacancy committee on Tuesday. And uh, there's an update in the newsletter, a little bit of, a little bit of background um, uh, about that. And uh, I think it's important to remember that everyone in the congregation is involved in the vacancy, not just people of the vacancy committee. It's a congregational decision. Um, and uh, so we, it's something we're all uh, involved in. In the newsletter, it encourages everyone uh, to pray, uh, to be patient, to be present in terms of attending uh, meetings in connection with the vacancy and to persevere. So if you haven't read that, I would encourage you to read it and uh, I'd encourage us all to, to pray, be patient, uh, be present and to persevere. Uh, in the past couple of weeks, we've had items in the newsletter about prayer opportunities and one in particular I'd just like to re-emphasize this morning is the prayer triplets. There are these little leaflets in the foyer. If you'd like to be in a prayer triplet, prick this, prick this uh, uh, leaflet up, follow the instructions, and, uh, and, that can be, and that can be arranged. Now, uh, I'd like to also give a very warm welcome to our preacher, Mr. William McKenzie. Uh, William, we appreciate you being with us today. We look forward to worshiping with you. So, uh, William, I'll now hand over to you. <clears throat> Good morning, and nice to be with you all again. I don't think there's, oh, there is. There's a young fellow here. That's good. There's, some of the children will be off with COVID or whatever, I presume. But we will reach the, um, the uh, children's story shortly. A call to worship. I wonder, do you think about the call to worship? You might think it's the man standing at the front that's calling you to worship. But that would be wrong. You might think that you called yourself to worship, but that would be wrong. The God of heaven is speaking to you, whether you're listening or not, and he's inviting you to worship him. And I would like to read a verse that does that for us. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And we'll begin to worship God this morning by singing to his praise in Psalm 67. Psalm 67, Lord bless and pity us, shine on us with thy face. You're enjoying the sun shining on you this morning, and so am I. But how much more wonderful it will be for you if today you enjoy the sun of righteousness shining on your heart and showing you something of himself. And we invite him to do that and plead with him so to do as we sing this psalm together.
And let us say, pray together in the expectation of what you and I have just sung together. This is the last verse we sang. God shall us bless. Men shall him fear. And to earth's utmost end. Lord, you are blessing us in that we are here. You are blessing us in that we are together. You are blessing us in that we are, some of us, connected by technology. You are blessing us in that we hear Give us the resolve. I will hear what God the Lord will speak to his folk. He'll speak peace. How excellent your name is. We see your handwork in the world around us. In the clear skies, we see the stars in the evening. You put them there. We see your handwork in the crocus coming through the ground. But grant that we would understand that you see us, that what we are thinking about, how our minds were occupied in the time before we came to church this morning, you know it. You set our secret faults, our secret thinking in the brightness of your face. And therefore, we come today as people who have failed each other, who have failed our families and ourselves, our community and our nation as people who have sinned in thought, in word, and in deed. And yet, in your mercy, you invite us and welcome us to come. That is amazing. Help us this morning to live in the light of death. Perhaps we should express it in the darkness of death. But it is because we die we are reminded of the reality of our sin. That we would live in the light of that, in the light of eternity. That death is not the end. Everybody we have met this morning, everybody we see, everyone in our family has to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Lord, have mercy. Open the windows of heaven, send forth a blessing by your Spirit to awaken the dead, to convince the sinner, to comfort the seeker, to console the bereaved, to revive your church, to awaken your church and revive us, to restore the years that the locusts have eaten, to come in a day of your power to fill our land and our hearts and our families with the glory and wonder of the gospel in the way that would give us to say thank you. You know, you have heard 
whether we have been thankful this morning. We know you tell us that we are to be thankful in everything. And alas, we have to confess that we are so self-centered. Deliver us from that. Create within us a fresh love for your love that is always fresh for us. Provide this people with a pastor after your own heart, one who would care for your glory, for the community, and for the hearts of the mind and hearts and minds of the rising generation. Guide the search committee. Give them that which they lack. Give them the wisdom they need. Uphold Malcolm McLean, the moderator, and also the presbytery as they pursue the vacancy here. We pray this morning for our Queen. Thank you for her 70 years of service. Thank you too for the way she has quietly reminded us of who you are. We pray for the government we have. Whether we agree with them or not is beside the point. Give us to pray for those in authority that we may live a quiet and peaceable life in godliness and honesty. Lord, deal with the Ukrainian situation and the fallout from it. Remove Putin, either in mercy or in judgment. Lord, bring him and the leaders in Eastern Europe to the feet of the cross. We think that's too much to ask. That's because we don't know who you are. We remember the bereaved. There'll be people amongst us today remembering their mothers who have gone. Remembering family members who died years ago. We pray for those who have experienced bereavement recently. And however long ago it is, it seems very recent. And it certainly is in our lives very sore as we remember those who brought so much to us. We remember those who are lonely who are single, those who are perhaps longing for a husband or a wife. We pray for them, that they would know that their maker is their husband and that he is the satisfying refuge. Please send laborers into your harvest. We pray for the college across the road here. Add to the number of students being prepared for the ministry of the word. We likewise pray for Edinburgh Theological Seminary. We remember Bob Ackroyd's wife today with her terminal cancer. Lord, there are so many situations which burden us in our responsibilities. We ask for grace to help all of us in this time of need. We pray this morning for a hearing 
ear, and an understanding heart for each of us. Open the windows of heaven. Send forth that which will draw us to say, my Lord and my God. Keep us for Jesus' sake. Forgive us for Jesus' sake. Help us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, we're all children at heart. Well, certainly I am. Just ask my grandchildren. So I was going to ask the children, but I'll not embarrass. I was going to ask the children what's going on in the countryside today or this past week. You'll have noticed it, perhaps, that there is a lot of activity in the fields. Certainly we have on our farm been sowing barley this week, sowing, sowing, sowing all day, every day. And I was going to mention what was important about sowing. And you know what it is. And Jesus spoke about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, I think. Yes, he did. These three books. He told a parable of the sower. The sower went forth to sow. He didn't have a tractor. He didn't have much in the way of technology. But he went forth to sow. And if you're going to sow, you need seed. And what do you do with the seed? You put it in the ground. Now, what does Jesus say about the parable of the sower? He says, this seed is God's word. And where does God's word need to be planted? In our hearts. And children, maybe, I hope there's one or two of you listening online. Children, the seed is the word, and it needs to be planted or sown in your heart. And when Jesus told that story, there were some people who didn't like it. There are some people who switched off, who said, it's not for me. There are some people who became occupied with other things. And perhaps you know what that is. You heard something in church on Sunday or from somebody about the Word of God, and you didn't think about it again. You didn't think about it an hour afterwards. You didn't think about it a week afterwards. You forgot it. Jesus speaks about them. And then Jesus speaks about the opposition that there is to the Bible, to the Word of God, to the message of the gospel. But anyway, I am doing what Jesus tells us to do, to sow the Word, to sow the seed. And I'm telling you what Jesus said. And it's going in this year, and I hope it's not going out that one. I hope it'll stick with you. Accept it. That's what Jesus says about the, the goods, the seed being sown. Some people accepted it as Jesus' word. Hide it. Keep it. Memorize it. Think about it. Accept it. Hide it in your heart. Think about it. Keep it. And memorize it. The seed is the word of God. That's what Jesus says about the word and about the seed. So, I better give you a 
few words from the Bible, from the Word of God, that are seed. So I'm going to give you a verse, a few words, that is the best of seed. And you know what you've got to do with it. Here it is. It's nine words. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So you've heard the seed now. If I met you tomorrow and asked you, did you get any seed yesterday? Was there any seed sown yesterday? You might say, well, there was, but I've forgotten it. Or you might say, there was, but actually, I wasn't interested. You might say, there was, and I've been thinking about it ever since. So that's what I wish you would do with God's help. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. You've all had a seed. God knows what you're doing with it. We'll now repeat the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you. So I suppose we go and sing now. I, oh, no, you read the Bible, William. Yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Lamentations chapter 3. It's a rather dismal-sounding title for a book in the Bible, isn't it? Lamentations. Lamentations chapter 3. It's after the book of Jeremiah. So I'm going to read from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 13 through to 27. Lamentations 3, verse 13. Here's this prophet, Jeremiah. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver, became the laughingstock of all my people. They mock me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and sated me with gall. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is, so I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them and my soul is downcast. My soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning, great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those who hope whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man to bear the yoke while he is young. And may the Lord help us to get a hold of what the message of that portion is. And may it be like the seed and take root in our hearts 
and bear fruit to his glory. We'll now sing from Sing Psalms. It's on Psalm 13. And we'll sing that psalm uh, to God's praise. God's help and for his glory, we would like to consider the words we read, in particular verse 21 of Lamentations chapter 3. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Well, I suppose you've been a bit like most of the rest of us, a little bit fearful lately. Perhaps you're anxious and lying awake when you heard Jason Leach say, there's going to be another COVID variant. And there has been. There's two running about America just now. Then there's the mess that there is in Eastern Europe, in Ukraine. Finley was telling me just before we came in that Moldova Half of them would like the Russians, and half of them would like the West. What a mess we're in. What is the outcome going to be? And then what's happening to the church in Scotland? 
Dunfermline, 10 Church of Scotland parishes, they're closing five of them. Inverness, they're closing five, four Church of Scotland buildings just now. What is happening? It's desperately sad for us, isn't it? And what about Afghanistan? The children there are still hungry. It's not only the children in Mariupol or whatever it is. Then, if you were living in Poland, what would you be saying or doing? Have we got enough food to feed all these people? Besides everything else. So, you've probably got some reasons for anxiety. Perhaps you've got a hospital appointment. I met somebody on Friday who said, once you hear you've got the big C, everything changes. This guy, he's younger than I am, and he heard he's got the big C. Are we going to be able to easily afford our gas bills. Ours is going up 54% next week. And these things are some of the causes that we have for our anxiety. And Jeremiah had them too, and I'll just go through some of those from, from Jeremiah, e e even in this uh, book itself. Chapter 2, verse 12. Children were begging for food. Chapter 2, verse 21. Young men and young women were being cut down by the sword in battle. Is that happening today in Eastern Europe? In chapter 1, verse 4, the roads were in a bad way. I've lost two tires this winter because the roads in Scotland are in a bad way. The city is empty. Things are bad. In chapter 3, he says here in verse 17, I've been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what happiness is. And he had a message, Jeremiah, to bring to his world. A message from God, you'll find it in chapter 14. God is going to send you judgment, the sword, the famine, the plague. And you have to tell them, Jeremiah, that they are stubborn, evil, and are not listening to me. Is that happening in Dingwall? Is that happening in this building? Are you listening to God? And then Jeremiah, his own situation. I'm in darkness. I can't escape. God has shut up my prayer. I feel like giving up. There it is. It's in verse 6, 7, and 8. Verse 8, this is the prophet saying, God shuts out my prayer. Verse 7, I can't escape. I don't know how to get away from this. Verse 6, I'm in darkness like those who have been dead already. Things are really tough, says Jeremiah. But then we have in verse 21. A message of hope. In the face of all this difficulty, is there going to be a place for him and for us to find help and hope? This I call to mind. That must be interesting. I would like to get a hold of that, wouldn't you? I would like to know where he's going when he says, this, this I call to mind. Things have been so desperate. 
Things seem so dark and you seem in such a terrible situation and yet you're saying you've got hope. What did you call to mind, Jeremiah? What did you do in the situation you were in? What did you come to think about? And friend, what worked for Jeremiah is what God tells us works for us here. The end of March, 2022. And there are five things that I would like you and I to think about together. They're all in this chapter. The first is this. The starting point for his deliverance. Verse 22. It is of his great love we are not consumed. And it's there in verse 29, the dust. He recognized where he was. In the dust and in need of mercy. Now, do you recognize you're in the dust? You're at the bottom of a pile of your own sin and the sin around you. You're in the dust and you are in need of mercy. Think about it, friend, what sin deserves. Not just the big sin. Not just the sin in the defrauding you may do of another but the sin that may lie in your own heart in rebellion against God. The sin you may have in saying, I'll leave my duty to another day. The sin you may have in thinking more of yourself than you ought to think. The sin of thinking less of others than you ought to think the sin of not thinking about God at all, of forgetting his word. Every sin. I should ask the question. I should invite you to stand up if you haven't sinned today. And I don't think anybody would stand up. You all know we all know that we have sinned since 11 o'clock when this service started. Remember what Isaiah said? The great gospel prophet, woe is me. I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. What did the psalmist say? Iniquities I must confess prevail against me too. Psalm 51, against thee, the only, have I sinned. Psalm 90, our sins, thou and iniquities, dost in thy presence place and setst our secret faults before the brightness of thy face. Now I don't think my wife has any understanding of the sin that's in my heart. She doesn't know what goes on in there. But I know that God knows, and it needs to be dealt with. So that's a starting point. The dust, the need of mercy. Then Jeremiah finds hope and confidence. In these verses, his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Is that right? Is that right? Well, it is right. It is absolutely right. You wouldn't have got up the steps. You wouldn't have got out the door this morning. Unless that's true. It 
in his mercy. What is repentance unto life is a saving grace, whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin, which is one above, which is the dust, out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God and Christ, doth with grief and hatred of his sin turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. Now that's from the Shorter Catechism, for which was designed for those like yourself and myself, who are of a lesser intellect. The larger catechism is much more pointed. Get a hold of that definition. What is repentance unto life? God reminds us in Exodus that he is merciful gracious, slow to wrath, abundant in loving kindness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. His mercy is everlasting. His mercy is over all his other works. We sang it often. I think you all have sang it often. Matt Boswell's hymn, what riches of kindness he lavished on us. His blood was the payment. His life was the cost. We stood neath a debt we could never afford. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Never runs dry. Inexhaustible fountain of mercy, new every morning. Now, I want to ask you a question. Are you glad to hear that? You might be saying, well, I've heard it before. Well, I quite often, like, I quite often get mince and potatoes. And I like mince and tatties. I've had it before, and I like it again. And again, well, here it is. His mercy is new every morning, and you here today are the evidence of it. Perhaps you've heard the story of Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and I'm taking this from the biography of him. Along with other prisoners... He worked in the fields day after day in rain and sun during summer and winter. His life appeared to be nothing more than back-breaking labor and slow starvation. The intense suffering reduced him to a state of despair. On one particular day, the hopelessness of his situation became too much for him he saw no reason to continue his struggle, no reason to keep on living. His life made no difference in the world, so he gave it all up. Leaving his shovel on the ground, he slowly walked to a crude bench and sat down. He knew that at any moment a guard would order him to stand up, and when he failed to respond, the guard would beat him to death, probably with his own shovel, he had seen it happen to other prisoners. As he waited, head down, he felt a presence. Slowly he looked up and saw a skinny old prisoner squat down beside him. The man said nothing. Instead, he used a stick to trace in the dirt the sign of the cross. The man then got back up and returned to his work. As Solzhenitsyn stared at the cross drawn in the dirt, his entire perspective changed. He knew he was the only one. He knew he was only one man against the all-powerful Soviet empire. Quite an appropriate story for some today. Yet he knew there was something greater than the evil he saw in the prison camp something greater than the Soviet Union. 
he knew that hope for all people was represented by that simple cross. Through the power of the cross, anything was possible. Solzhenitsyn slowly rose to his feet, picked up his shovel, and went back to work. Outwardly, nothing had changed. Inside, he had received hope. He had seen the cross. What's that hymn say? Hold thou thy cross before my closing eyes. Shine through the, groom, through the gloom and point me to the skies. Heaven's morning breaks. Earth's vain shadows flee. In life, in death, O oh Lord, abide with me. In the dust, hoping in the mercy, What's the third thing he calls to mind? Verse 24. The Lord is my portion. The Lord, it's my, he's mine. I've got him. The Lord is my shepherd. My beloved is mine, and I am his. Have you got that? That should be enough to keep you going for the rest of the week. The Lord is my portion. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my friend. The Lord's my brother. The Lord's my helper. The Lord's my present help. Isn't that what God is doing? To present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. If you can say the Lord is your portion, God says to you all things are yours and you are Christ and Christ is God. You might be saying with Psalm 73, my flesh and my heart doth faint, faint and fail, but God doth fail me never. Psalm 119, thou my sure portion art alone. Jesus often goes, if you look through the four Gospels, you find him when he meets people it's got a slightly unusual way of greeting people. Just notice that this week. He, he doesn't um, say, hello, how are you today? He doesn't say, hello, it's a nice day. Well, that's the kind of thing I say. What he says to them is this, don't be afraid. Fear not. That's, a, that's an unusual way to greet somebody. Isn't it? Don't be afraid. Fear not. Be of good courage. Take heart. Then we can say God is our refuge. He's our fortress. The Lord shall keep my soul. We were at, or I was anyway, the deathbed of a, a good friend last week. And I'd known this dear lady for a long, long time. And we read together Psalm 121. And she was so glad, and so was I, for the word keep. The Lord shall keep thy soul. And you know, she said something. She said a lot of things, actually, that were, some were very interesting. She had some lovely stories. She had a lovely story about the late Jackie Ross, which was amusing. 
But one of the things she said, it's wonderful, she said, I have no boxes to tick. Jesus did it all. Have you got that? Can you say that? I have no boxes to tick. Jesus did it all. The Lord shall keep me. The Lord is my portion. And then verse 24. I will wait for him. Patiently. It is good that a man should hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. I waited for the Lord my God. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Those who have fled for refuge to the hope set before them in the gospel. Which hope we have as an anchor to the soul. Are you waiting? Perhaps you're waiting for the service to end. It won't be long. It'll be, we'll be done in 10 minutes. I remember as a boy, actually, the minister saying something like that, the preacher. And he asked, what are you waiting for? And I was sitting there somewhere. And I was saying, well, I know that there's roast beef in the oven. That's what I'm waiting for. And it rebuked me. I was wanting the service over so that I could get home from my roast beef and golden wonder. But are you waiting for the Lord? They that wait upon the Lord. Can you give him a few minutes? It's not a few minutes he's asking He's asking for a lifetime. Take my life and let it be. On him dependeth all my hope and expectation. I will hope. I will hope. I have hope. So we looked at four aspects of what kept Jeremiah going. We've looked at where he found himself to be in the dust. What he saw he needed the mercy of God. What he proclaimed the Lord is my portion and the Lord is my hope. And then the last one, the sovereignty and the justice of God. You'll see it in verse 36. It's there in verse 36 about justice. Verse 37, who has spoken and it doesn't come to pass. It's in verse 38 too. He does all things. He's sovereign over all. Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that calamities and good things come? God is just. I think sometimes things are very unfair. I often find myself as saying it's not fair. But how wrong we are in forgetting that God is just and coming to say like Job, I know. Things seem very bad, but my Redeemer lives. Doesn't it God who says to us, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should turn from his evil way and live, turn to Christ who became one of us who lived and died and rose again for us, so that today I freely on his part, behalf, offer you Christ, invite you to him, and embrace him.
so that you can say, this I have called to mind, and therefore I have hope. Think of him who said, not my will, but yours be done. He wasn't saying it's not fear. Even if your will is to forsake me, to curse me, to condemn me, not for my sin, but for the sin of my people. Give the cup of wrath to me, he said. I'll drink. God is just. Who, in the finality of it, could say verses 1 and 2 and 3 of this chapter? Think of it. This was Jesus. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of his wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness. He has turned his hand against me all day long. He knew your hell and he consumed it. He knows the power of the wrath of God and I have no idea what it is and neither have you. You have no idea what the wrath of God is because you're still on mercy's ground and after 10,000 years in a lost eternity you will still not know what the wrath of God is because it still is the wrath which is to come. But Jesus knew that wrath. Fading are the worldlings' pleasures, all their boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children know. And as you look to him who bore your sin on Calvary's tree, who has ascended your Prince and your Saviour. You can say with Jeremiah, this I have called to mind, and therefore I have hope. Therefore, you are worshipping him. Therefore, you're looking beyond the inadequacies or idiosyncrasies of the preacher. You're looking to Jesus and saying, he's altogether lovely. This I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Let's pray. Lord, you've been planting seed. Granted, it would take root and bear forth the fruit of praise that we would be leaving this building saying, I have hope because I've been calling to mind who Jesus is and what he's done. And I've been saying thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Bless each of us in our individual responsibilities. Forgive us for our sin, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And the concluding praise is, My hope is built on nothing less.
Dear Lord, you help all of us here today to say my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. It is of your mercy we are here. Bring us to the place where Jeremiah was. In mercy, please help us to see that we are in the dust. Help us to see that it is of your mercy we are here. Help us to come to say, therefore I have hope. The Lord is my portion, all together, everything for me. Pardon us for Jesus' sake. Amen.